magicking people into corporeal presence. Um, Jacob, um, uh, at some point I will make you disappear as well. All right, uh, welcome all. Sorry for the technical glitch, uh, which, it, which continues in that we don't have Andrew visible, but we will fix that as we can. Um, Andrew, um, I am going to unmute you, so at least, or you should unmute yourself so that at least we can hear you. Um, Thanks, Ben, for putting this together. I really appreciate it. Yeah, my, uh, uh, um, my apologies that it is, uh, that, that the tech is a little bit uh, hinky today. Um, so this uh, uh, conversation came about because uh, Jack and Andrew wrote a provocative piece in The Atlantic, um, which I want to say I don't think is quite as provocative as it was in fact provoking. Um, so I want to, uh, I, I asked uh, them to do this, uh, both to uh, uh, clarify what they were and weren't saying in that piece, which uh, for those of you who are not aware of the controversy has caused uh, immense consternation, real and feigned in all corners of the uh, interwebs and Fox News and uh, I guess you guys were denounced by name by Tucker Carlson. Is that right? He kind of agreed with us, actually, with our descriptive claims. But then he said things like, we want to kill the First Amendment in the United States and embrace Chinese-style authoritarianism. Right. So, um, Wait, Jack, guess, that's not your view? <laughs> no, that's so not I, my guess, view. I guess my, my uh, let, uh, you know, uh, what I wanted to do, first of all, was to like have an, you know, an opportunity for you guys to clarify what you weren't, were and were not saying in the piece. But then I also think the substantive argument is super interesting and provocative in and of itself. So I wanted to have a conversation about the actual article that you guys wrote rather than the one of the fevered imaginations of uh, many critics. Uh, so let's start with a important substantive question. When did you both become members of the Chinese Communist Party? <laughs> uh, <laughs> that was certainly not our aim in writing this piece. Um, right. So start with a description of the piece yeah. and the controversy. Yeah. I'll start off and Andrew can fill in. Um, you know, I actually didn't think that this was going to be very controversial. The, the, the piece started off with the following motivation. When, uh, when the tech companies came out of their defensive crouch, as we called it, after the, in the COVID-19 crisis, and started being very proactive in terms of dealing with the crisis and being very open about how they were going to um, be more aggressive on censorship related to misinformation and other things related to COVID, um, and as the Google and Apple initiative got going about developing an API to do contact tracing and the like, there was a rush of worries by the civil liberties group. Some people saying actually that this is a new constitutional moment for the tech companies. Other people saying we understand why they're doing this, but we hope it goes back to normal after uh, the crisis passes and really the main ambition of the piece was to say there is no normal to go back to, that what's happening now reflects a trend that's been going on for 10 or 15 years of ever increasing involvement by the platforms in regulating speech in ever more controversial ways on their platforms and by government nudging uh, the platforms to regulate speech in a certain way and by the platforms working with the government on both um, in this case, speech initiatives and drawing on government sources to define what was acceptable speech and in working out uh, surveillance possibilities for COVID. The main thrust of the piece was to point out that all of those things have been happening. There's a trend in that direction. The reason there's a trend in that direction in a nutshell is because um, there are increasing harms on the network and the harms need to be addressed and the companies are aware of this and they've been trying to address them. Increasingly, they've been struggling to do so legitimately. Zuckerberg is simultaneously working on a Supreme Court of Facebook to try to legitimate these content decisions and seeking government help. And so the point of the piece mainly was 
if you think this is something new and that and we're going back to something different, that's just false. This is where we've been going for a while and we're going to keep going that way. And it was in that context, if I should say one more thing, it was in that context that we made a claim that angered a lot of people. We said, I'm paraphrasing, we said <laughs> in the great debate about uh, internet freedom versus internet control over the last two decades, China was largely right and the United States was largely wrong. And what I think we meant by that, Andrew can speak for himself, but what I meant by that was that, you know, 20 years ago, the U.S. government was pushing, 50, you know, 20 years ago, 15 years ago, 10 years ago, the government and the tech firms were pushing an internet freedom agenda where they downplayed uh, harms on the net, downplayed the, the need to uh, regulate speech on the net. They were scoffing at China for its uh, worries about information operations, social disruption, and the like. And basically, the point of that was that the internet freedom ideal is dead, and that there's going to be significant regulation of the space. It's going to involve a government element. Um, how much of a government element, how it's allocated between the private sector and the public sector, and what the values are, and how that affects our constitutional system are the questions we put on the table but didn't try to address. Do you mean right in the descriptive context that there would be authority, sometimes heavy-handed authority, watching people and, uh, and uh, regulating speech online, not in the normative context that China's substantive regulations are reasonable? Correct. Yeah. And that was, go ahead, Andrew. Yeah, just that the, um, we made a prediction that the future of the internet would be unregulated. And China made a prediction that the future of the internet would involve lots of controls. And they were largely right in that sense. And, you know, people say, part of the thing we're trying to point out in this paper is that uh, people want it both ways with the internet. They want um, all of the conveniences that the surveillance society brings, but then they don't like the idea of being surveilled. And they want an internet where there's no cyber bullying and no revenge porn and no extremist, you know, violent extremism, but they also don't want speech controls and you can't have it both ways. And I think at the end of the day, we, we, we come back to this idea that there are three possibilities. There's an internet that's unregulated. And if you want an internet that's completely unregulated, Wild West, you have to, you have, to have an argument for why we should embrace that and with all of the downsides, election hacking, misinformation, and so on, that come with it. If you don't want that, and I don't personally know anybody who thinks that's the right way to go about things, the question then is, what kinds of regulations are we gonna have on the internet, and who gets to decide? And right now, we're letting corporations make a lot of the decisions, and um, you know, China does it from its top town from the state, um, and we'll see where in the, you know, in the, where in the U.S. Uh, we head over the next few years. But the trend, is, the trend is in the government getting more involved and the companies asking the government, at least in ways that they think is useful to them to get more involved. Right. Okay. Uh, uh, let's pause a minute for a technical thing. Andrew, I think you should be able to turn your video on now. Oh, great. Hi, everybody. There we go. Um, I have uh, magically uh, <laughs> fixed, uh, overridden Zoom's efforts to assert authority over this and prevent me from exercising substantive content regulation, prevent me from having uh, our guests visible to you. Now Thank we have everybody. both of them, uh, and this is an example of subverting this authority. It's like going around the great firewall of China. All right, so I wanna, um, uh, let's talk a minute about the controversy. Um, I do think that one paragraph where you said China was largely right and the United States was largely wrong was amenable to uh, real misunderstanding. Um, and actually it made me kind of yeah, when I when I first read it as well. And so I can understand how people kind of got their backs up about it. It's clearly in the context of the article not making quite the normative claim that it seems to be or a normative claim that it seems to be if you pull it out of context. But uh, I, I guess my question is, like, what has the nature of the criticism been? Where has it come from? 
and to what extent do you think it is uh, a good faith misunderstanding and to what extent do you think it's a, uh, hey, we got these two radical left law professors who were making an argument in the Atlantic that, that the Chinese Communist Party got this right, uh, this is good red meat. Do you, you want to go first? That injury, you want me to? Yeah, I'll just say, I mean, I, I was, I think Jack, um, having been a long standing member of the Chinese Communist Party, Jack is more, <laughs> is, is more accustomed to the kind of vitriol that, uh, that we received than I am. I was genuinely taken aback by it. And I've been trying to figure out where it comes from. Um, one, one strand of the reaction, which is deeply emotional and maybe not entirely rational, is um, how dare you, and like rooted in patriotism, how dare you say the US is like China? How dare you even compare the two or mention the two in the same sentence? And some of the voicemails and emails that I got are deeply xenophobic and racist. And I think just as a barometer of like where we are as a country vis-a-vis -vis China, that's very, that's terrifying to me. Um, there's a second piece of it, which is the vitriol towards tech companies. I, I, you know, there's lots of talk right now about the tech lash being over because we depend on technology in the time of coronavirus. Man, the messages I'm receiving, the anger, uh, you know, Tucker Carlson building an entire show around this is anti-Chinese and also anti-Facebook. And in that sense, they're underlining our point that the two are building similar systems. You could, one, one coherent view is to reject both, right? And to demand the Wild West. Um, and, but pointing out the similarities was in part our point. Um, so we have an, a question from Henning Lachman, which reminds me uh, to tell you just to control Zoom bombing. Uh, we, uh, if you want to leave a question, you can't uh, uh, just speak up or send it in a chat. Leave, the, leave your questions in the Q&A uh, and we will bring you into the conversation as we are doing with uh, Henning now uh, once we verify that your question is for real and not a harassment effort. Henning, the floor is yours. Yeah, thanks everyone for having us, having me and um, for this interesting conversation. And also thank you for the piece. I did not find it that controversial actually. I was not um, so taken aback, but I, what I was wondering and what my question is, why make the comparison between the US and China and not when it comes to regulation between the US and Europe, which would have been less controversial maybe um, to begin with. Like why focus on China and not on, on Europe and their approach to, to free speech and surveillance on the internet? Yeah, that's a fair, very fair question. We could have and maybe probably maybe should have made the comparison to Europe. I mean, the debate as I've been following it for um, 25 years is basically between, and this is, this is reductive, but it's basically between three systems, extreme control by China, intermediate control, I would say by Europe and kind of freedom by the United States. And we were just defining the polar positions and to the extent, you know, may, maybe we should have compared it to, uh, to Europe. It's just, I've always thought of these things as uh, polar, the Chinese perspective of control is going to be necessary and important, not necessarily public control, but, uh, and the United States taking the other extreme. And you're right, Europe is in the middle. And, um, you know, maybe what the system we're going to end up with is, is going to look something like, uh, like Europe, uh, the United States, that is. Um, so that we could have said, we could have done that. It seems to me, though, that, that one of the big differences, and you talk about this in the piece, but uh, I want to flesh it out here. The, the big difference is that there is no Chinese Communist Party in the United States, despite both of your efforts to join it. Um, you know, the, the authority figure um, are the platforms which have somewhat different policies from one another, um, which people do get to choose between. It's uh, the world on Reddit is different from the world on Twitter, is different from the world on Facebook. And none of them are, at least in the content regulation space, being directed by a central authority 
of you know Donald Trump or Nancy Pelosi, uh, whereas the Chinese Communist Party is exercising control very directly um, and um, and itself, and it is not you know WeChat is not regulating speech in a in a fashion independent of the political interests of the uh, of the political bosses. And so I guess my, my question is, how big a difference is that? And why isn't that difference effectively total in the sense that, hey, you know, I run Lawfare uh, and you guys write for Lawfare. And if Facebook doesn't like what we say on Lawfare, so what? We get to say it anyway. There's still really a marketplace of ideas. Chinese Lawfare doesn't exist. Andrew, you want to take it? You want me to take well, it? Let me just say, I'm not sure the premise is right. I mean, my, my sense is, um, Ben, correct me if this is wrong, but my sense is that to the extent that there is, um, when, when the internet began, American internet companies thought about having a no speech policy or a speech policy that tracked the First Amendment. And then customers started demanding controls for things that would be First Amendment protected, but nonetheless not nice for some members of the online community. And so although Twitter and Facebook and YouTube have different policies, they're pretty consistent. And if that's the case, if we have an oligopoly system with very similar policies, you don't have a lot of choice. The marketplace of ideas isn't really working for you. And if you want, but yet if you want to run Der Sturmer, uh, which last I checked, I think is still there, mm -hmm. um, you know, there is ultimately at the bottom of the stack some, you know, if Cloudflare won't protect you, you're, right. you're pretty screwed. But uh, the diversity of expressible views in, on Facebook is dramatically higher than the diversity of expressible views on, um, on you know, in Beijing. And the diversity of expressible views, if you're willing to go outside of Facebook, I, I mean, I think you probably shouldn't run the let's kill Andrew Keen Woods dot com site, right? Like you might that that you're going to get in trouble for that. But short of that, like, what are the subjects that you cannot discuss on the internet, even if they violate the terms of service of, I mean, you might face social opprobrium, and by the way, you should, um, but what are the, like, but I don't think the internet is really preventing you from doing that. It's just certain platforms are, and if you don't like that, you express it somewhere else. So can I say a couple of things here? Yeah. The first thing, one more thing about the China versus U.S. Another reason that we, and then I'll answer this line of questions. Another reason that I thought that the China-US contest was the right one to reference was the United States for 15 years, starting with Bill Clinton and reaching a high point with Hillary Clinton, has basically said that system's not gonna work. Our system is gonna work. The freedom non-regulation, non-content regulation, minimal economic regulation uh, approach is the best one and we're exporting that and we're going to do everything we can to make that happen and we're going to win and the internet is going to defeat authoritarian networks. That was the debate we're talking about. It wasn't talking about, we weren't making a claim and, and that debate, the Europe, Europe doesn't really fit into that because the United States wasn't engaged with Europe really on that question. Um, if, there, if your point Ben is, is that there's massively more freedom of speech in the United States than in China, I, mean, I actually think it's complicated, but of course that's true about some topics. You just can't discuss certain topics at all there. That's not even true. The way they regulate it is very sophisticated. But um, there's no doubt that that's right. The and we weren't, we weren't even getting into that issue either. But there is a question, and there's a question that's being debated every day in the United States, and it's not at all settled, about there is increasing regulation of speech. The face Facebook has a long list of different areas that they regulate, they have very open-ended definitions about what they regulate, they, they show us in some categories all the things they're taking down and the number of mistakes that they make. So there's a lot and increasing and increasingly automated speech regulation going on in these networks. So the one big question is, given, uh, yes, there's still a market, I guess, but given the dominance of Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube, 
maybe Reddit, given the dominance of those platforms, given that they have speech criteria that are much narrower than the First Amendment would allow, given that most public speech takes place on those platforms, there's a very large and difficult question, which a lot of people have been debating about whether the platforms have, should be setting these rules, which are in effect contracting the First Amendment in practice. I'm not saying eliminating it at all, but it's contracting. If, if these are the main ways that you can speak in the public forum, then they're effectively contracting uh, speech in this country. And even Facebook realizes that they're in a precarious position on this stuff. They're taking two initiatives. They realize it's really hard because everything they do is politically contested. They do something, they take a right wing site down and the left goes crazy and vice versa. And they have a very hard time doing this. They're, they're desperate to try to find a way to do this legitimately. And it's very hard for a private for-profit company that's regulating the public forum of the United States to do so legitimately. So they're trying to come up with this Supreme Court idea, which they think will give them some objective way or at least legitimate way to tell us what speech is and isn't acceptable. I'm very skeptical about that. And they're at the same time asking for help from the government. Zuckerberg had this remarkable post where he said, you know, we really can't do this by ourselves. We need government guidance. So these are, and, and so the prediction of the piece was, the, one of the points of the piece was, and the prediction of the piece is, as these harms become more apparent, the misinformation thing was huge on this. The government cares more because it's not clear that the, that the firms are doing the speech regulation quote unquote right or legitimately, but the government and at the same time, the, the companies aren't sure they're doing it right or legitimately. And there's a question about how this authority is gonna be allocated. And we predict that the government's gonna get more involved. It has been getting more involved. It's not clear what forms that involvement is going to take. And then the question becomes, as we said in the piece, what happens to the First Amendment? Um, okay, uh, Rutherford has a question uh, that is kind of a uh, expansion of, uh, 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 it's a sort of return to the first principles on that. Uh, Rutherford, the floor is yours. Yeah, my question to you guys is, um, on this whole controversy surrounding free speech absolutism. Uh, in, in your minds, what are the liabilities of uh, the permissiveness of granting absolute um, uncensored free speech? Uh, as opposed, you know, in your mind, what is the balance of the risks and the rewards of such unfettered free speech absolutism? So, I, I mean, I think it's like, you know, we've, we've sort of skated over the 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 question here of why why this vision that the United States had lost and I think Rutherford's question kind of gets to that but so like go back Jack to you know chapter five of your view your book with Tim Wu which is where I think you guys first proposed that you know, the authority of the state was not going away here. And um, so why, why did, why did the, why did the unfettered free speech vision of the internet lose? Or why is it losing? And is it wrong or right that it should lose? Okay, the reason, there are many reasons it lost. It lost because the unfettered free speech view turned out to produce massive social costs that we just weren't willing to accept. It's that simple. Um, and the early, early visions of the net, the, the Johnson and Post 1995, they kind of papered over this or they assumed that there wouldn't be spillovers from one community into other communities. But the fact is, is that they're just massive social costs. Take the easy ones, child pornography, misinformation operations in uh, the United States violent speech that provoked violence in the real world. Um, there are all sorts of things that happen on the platform, growingly so, that cause social harm, and that the platforms themselves, so that, that's, the, that's the short answer about why, and then the, the list has been growing and becoming increasingly controversial as it expands, but the short answer is that um, unfettered speech produced huge externalities and massive social costs that no one very few were willing to accept. Yeah, you know, can I just say that the internet, one thing that every speech expert in the world is 
grappling with is how the internet changes things, right? And I think um, in many, many areas of the law, I'm skeptical that the internet upends everything we know. But in speech, it really does change a lot. I mean, we used to think that the answer to bad speech or wrong speech was more speech. And the internet proves that more speech doesn't always solve that problem. Um, we just have, it's just a completely never before seen set of, of facts in the world that really test how we feel our commitments to an unregulated um, speech platform. So I wanna uh, pose a, um, pose a defense of the radical free speech is winning argument. Mm -hmm. And I'm posing this, I'm, I'm composing it on the spot and I don't know that I believe a word of it, but, um, but I wanna throw it out there for fun. Um, so point number one, I accept everything you're saying about the increasing efforts to regulate this material. Point number two, there's a lot of child pornography available anyway. You know, if the demand is to curb abusive behavior on the internet, as both of you have been recent witnesses, and I was a subject last night, there were some documents released about General Flynn, and for some reason, this had a lot of, re gave a lot of people reason to tweet hateful things at me. Um, there is a huge amount of abuse. Um, there's a, a efforts to uh, curb racism, racist speech, uh, uh, and other hate speech. There's an immense amount of hate speech. So why, like, it seems to me the paradox of your argument is that this assert, these assertions of authority may be quite effective as to individuals. That is, Milo Yiannopoulos is no longer on Twitter. But they're actually almost completely ineffective. Oh, oh, and disinformation. I mean, the internet is awash in disinformation, right? And so the, these, these efforts are immensely effective at kind of harassing individuals who participate in this stuff uh, and achieve a certain level of renown but they're massively ineffective at the policy objectives to which they aspire. The result being that in fact, the internet is an unregulated free speech zone in the aggregate, despite individuals being uh, uh, cancelable for individual acts of speech. So my question is in light of that, relentlessly inarticulate presentation of facts, quasi-facts, and falsehoods, um, is untrammeled free speech doing better than you guys are allowing for, at least in the aggregate? Like, what are the ideas that you can't find on the internet? Yeah, Ben, can I just say that that account, um, as disheartening as it is, I think it's just a story about all why the pressures we describe are going to continue, right? You just described a, set, a scenario in which the demands, <clears throat> the unhappiness of everybody on the internet is going to lead to more calls for greater controls. And forget what Jack and I think for a sec. We actually tried not to put too much of our own personal views in this and our thoughts on speech are evolving. Um, it's just incredibly complex. But one thing that is crystal clear, and this came up yesterday, we were on a call with some people who have been involved with uh, Facebook's internal Supreme Court thing, um, internal external Supreme Court thing. And it, it's absolutely the case that people want it both ways. So people who are on these platforms are demanding more controls, right? So that the, one of the things that we're just trying to say simply as a matter of fact is people say they want free speech, but they also want less bullying and less racism and less everything else. And those two things are incompatible. There is, there, is a, there is a clash there. And I would just add, Ben, that um, the goal of regulation is rarely to eliminate the evil. It's to bring it uh, under an acceptable control and an acceptable cost. And um, you're right that there's flourishing speech environment. China's speech environment is not the way most people portray it. There's a lot of anti-government 
sentiment being expressed on the internet there. The, the state allows it to happen. It's more of a wild, wild west, although ultimately they come down with a hammer and they have all sorts of subtle controls. So the fact that there's still, the fact that there's still a lot of speech, we're, we're not saying that speech is being cut down in the United States. We did, I don't think we said that. We said that controls on speech have been increasing and are going to continue to increase. And we don't know where it's gonna stop. Just to take an example of misinformation. If, um, and, and these, so the social media is just, it's just a cauldron of misinformation. I mean, it's just a misinformation generator. And it is the reaction to this piece being yeah, a great exactly. example. Exactly, and, 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 and an information weaponizer. And uh, it really does change the way speech works in this country. If, to take an example, there are both domestic and foreign misinformation operations of a serious scale that really screw up the November election in addition to whatever else may happen, the country is not going to just acquiesce. It's going to do something to deal with the problem. And that is not going to mean less control. It's going to mean more control. I don't know what it looks like. But th the point is, is that the controls will respond to the perceived needs of the country's assessment of what the harms are and how they can best be fixed. And we're right in the middle of sorting out who's going to do that and what the rules are going to be. The only point we were making, I don't... <laughs> It, it's hard to imagine the United States not having flourishing free speech, but there's going to be a lot more control than we used to accept. We already have a lot more control compared to 10 years ago. We have a lot more government involvement compared to 10 years ago. Section 230 is on the chopping block. I think that uh, the immunities there are going to be whittled away slowly but surely. I don't know what the world looks like after that happens, but it looks a lot different. So yes, there's still flourishing speech, but yes, there's more control. Um, Yuan Li Li uh, writes in with a question, um, actually, or a, a, a set of observations about the speech environment in China. Uh, the floor is yours. You got to unmute yourself, though. Sorry. There you go. Um, hello. I, I once had a meeting together with the Tencent company and, the, and their staff told me that they worry a lot about their regulation in their own platform because they wanted desperately, as you said, the government's guide uh, so they can make sure that their policy are, are right and they do not need to take any responsibility. So my question is that if the... Um, it is the practice in China that the platform, when the government tried to, um, in the practice, they cooperate to do the regulation. Um, for example, uh, they combat the crimes in the internet once a year officially do this uh, cooperation. And um, if they do that together, is there any difference between the platform regulation and the government regulation? Because the boundary seems to be a little blurry. Thank you. Uh, Andrew, do you want to take that one? Sure. I'll just say, I mean, one thing we have thought about is that is this question, um, and we need to learn much more about the Chinese um, market government relationship. Is it the case, I think you just described a scenario in which the company, by having strict guidelines from the government, is in a position of having clarity about what they need to do. And that would maybe put them at a competitive advantage over a company that is, you know, um, struggling to figure out and craft on its own a set of policies with not a lot of guidance from the government. That would be a scenario in which you say, um, you know, you might find someone like Mark Zuckerberg saying, pleading after years of resisting government intervention, pleading for government intervention. Jack, do you have thoughts on that? I just want to zoom out from that and say that the essential problem is normatively, that there are huge problems with three or four platforms regu regulating the public forum in this country, um, basically pursuant to the same standards that are narrower than the First Amendment, as I said. That presents a whole set of problems about legitimacy that the companies are exquisitely aware of. And so that's a problem. Having the government prescribe the rules is also a huge problem. I don't have any idea. There's going to be some combination of answers. 
uh, from the government side, we've already seen this, and the private side. I don't know what that allocation looks like, and I don't know what the rules look like, but there's no, right now, the, the current equilibrium is not stable. I don't think anybody thinks it's stable. It's going to move, and it's probably going to move. This is a prediction, not an endorsement in the direction of more government involvement, as it has been. Even if it's, it's going to be, even if it's, as Facebook has started, as the social media started to do, taking guidance from the government about what counts as acceptable and not acceptable speech. They've done this, I think, in the uh, misinformation context, and they've done this in the COVID-19 context from, author from authorities, international and domestic authorities. They've taken a whole set of cues from threats from Congress, even though Congress hasn't legislated on this. And they're exquisitely sensitive to that. So, so we're sorting all this out, and I have no idea. I don't, I mean, I don't have a strong view about what the right answer is. It seems to me to be a hugely hard problem. So I want to, again, just for purposes of being contrary, I want to argue the other side, which is there have always been privately owned forums, whether they be newspapers or political parties or, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, social meeting spaces, you know, where towns gather and uh, witches are burned at the stake, um, uh, where the range of acceptable opinion at the risk of expulsion from those communities are uh, way narrower than the risk, than the, the First Amendment. Um, and so the First Amendment protected your right to advocate for the abolition of slavery, but there were places that you didn't want to go in order to do that, not just because you would get killed, but because those views were not welcome there in a, in a, in a narrowly social sense, which is why the abolitionist movement centered around certain communities, including the one that I went to college in. Um, so my question is, how different is this really? I used to run one of, you know, work for one of these. I would get, when I would work for the Washington Post, I would get um, uh, submissions from, and I, I would be the person who reviewed the ones from most law professors. And you know, so there was the First Amendment, and then there was what I thought was just, you know, sufficient errant nonsense that I wasn't willing to let a law professor say that on the pages of the Washington Post. And there were some famous law professors who didn't get any op-eds published. And so I guess, I mean, it's obviously scaled completely differently, but there have always been these intermediary actors that actually condition real speech in private. And just as when the Reverend Moon decided that, you know, people like me were not being adequately fair to conservative speech, he went and founded the Washington Times. Um, why isn't the, you know, there's the formal free speech, the, the, the de facto free speech that the mediators let you participate in. And then if you really don't like it, you go found 4chan or 8chan or, or, um, or some other institution that is more amenable to those views. And so my question is, how, how different is it really? Andrew, do you have a view on that? You may take it correct. I'll just say that um, yesterday we were chatting with a couple of First Amendment experts and they all agreed that this is just a completely different landscape, that the, that the difference in, in the sense that everybody gets to say something, um, but not different in the sense that we are trending towards an older model of having gatekeepers. And that's the system you described, right, of having editors who curate and block out crazy or radical or unacceptable or whatever, just block out some views. Um, that was maybe a crucial piece of the system. And now we don't have it and we're dealing with a mess and we're trying to cobble together a set of rules to have some control over this space. You know, what are those rules? Without saying anything about them, we're describing a trend towards more control. 
And I would just say, I actually think the analogy between this is nothing else that grew out of this conversation we were in yesterday. I think what you're saying, Ben, is there used to be a time 60, 70 years ago when there were six or seven or eight outlets who determined mostly what the nation saw and learned. Right. And they excluded lots of speech. And yes, you could go into underground places and you could go into local newspapers. And this situation you're saying is sort of like that. Um, so it's different in a lot of ways because, I mean, I, I haven't sorted all this through, but it, it, speech wasn't weaponizable back then the way that it is now. You couldn't cause the harms through those, um, through the 1950s outlets the way you can on these outlets. The number of speakers weren't anywhere close in terms of percentage or it just wasn't in the same universe. And the ability of the technology to allow speech to be used in all sorts of harmful ways was just not, it wasn't the same back then as it is now. So I think that there is, so yes, there was these central points, but there's much greater need for dealing with problems generated by speech now than then. And I think one by these big controllers, and I think one indication of this is you would never have Think about this. Zuckerberg wrote this piece saying, we just can't do this by ourselves. We need government guidance. Can you imagine the Washington Post saying that in the 1970s? I think there's a huge difference there. Right. I, I agree with that on, uh, with respect to the Washington Post in the 70s or now. Right. Um, traditional media would, but then again, traditional media, and I think this is one of the very sharp divides in this conversation, traditional media embraces its editorial function and social media has an extremely ambivalent relationship with it, partly conditioned by section 230, that they know that the more, the more editorial they get, the less, uh, the less protection they get and the more responsibility they acquire for the substance of the speech. And, um, you know, and so that creates a weird incentive structure to disclaim editing and yet to somehow still have standards. And, you know, it always reminds me of that scene in the Robert Altman movie, The Player, where uh, the studio execs are uh, trying to figure out how to reduce the price of screenplays. And one of them suggests replacing writers with um, with just grabbing uh, story threads out of the newspaper. And another one of the studio execs just says, you know, I'm just musing on the idea of removing the writer from the creative process. And that's what the social media companies are trying to do. They're trying to remove the editor from the editorial process. And it's a, actually a really difficult thing to do. Um, Ken Landa, the floor is yours. Hey, uh, good morning. So uh, you, you've laid out, a, I think, a very compelling case for the sources of the problem. And I, I liked your point about the negative externalities of the unregulated speech environment leading to a push for more regulation. Um, some of those externalities were, were borne by other users of the platform. Some would be borne by the platform and their own maintenance of their brands and their reputation. The platforms pursued huge scale and network effects as a core strategy. They wanted there to be one Facebook, one Twitter, one YouTube, et cetera. So I'm wondering whether disaggregation and more forum segregation would help deal with some of those externalities to other users, to particular brands, and maybe help mitigate the need or the instinct for top-down control. Or is it already too late or for other reasons too dangerous or not productive to pursue that kind of strategy? So, this is a great question. If I understand the question, let me just put it in my words. The question is, would breaking up some of the big platforms and forcing more decentralization and competition, would it help deal with this problem? Is that so the question? Either, and either by force or by their own strategies. Yeah, right. So I haven't thought this all the way through and a lot of people have been thinking about this more than I have. I've actually never seen a compelling argument that breaking them up would make the problem better. Uh, especially when things like misinformation and um, especially foreign influence operations, it's very hard to see. I think in those contexts, centralization helps. 
And I don't also don't see, I, I'm not saying the argument's there, I just don't see it. I don't see in general why if we went from three or four dominant players to 10 dominant players, um, which in a kind of way we have, I mean, there are lots of different social kinds, different kinds of social media. There are three or four that dominate. I just don't see how it would help the problem. What is the argument that it would help the problem? Um, my, my thought is that compartmentalization in the early days of the internet made a, a difference, that Usenet, you chose what channel you were in and that's what you were exposed to. And there was no brand uh, who was vulnerable to Usenet uh, going off piece to the way some other contexts we now have. But do you also prohibit cross-platform posting and interchange? I, I'm not saying that I have the prescription. I'm, I'm sort of trying to tease out whether, um, whether it's the extreme networking that leads to extreme amplification and acceleration of everything could somehow be attenuated um, by some barriers. Yeah, can I, can I just jump in? I think that's, um, depending on the perspective, who, from whose perspective are we thinking about the problem, um, that is compelling or not compelling. So, for example, um, Russians are attempting to influence our elections from that perspective, and we need controls or we need someone with a lot of capability managing this. From that perspective, a small group of very well-resourced players might be better than a dozen different platforms. But to Ben's point initially about, you know, what's so bad about the private market, set, leaving this to the private market, marketplace of ideas, you don't like the rules on TikTok, you jump on a different platform. From that perspective, surely, um, you know, having more players means more options, right? So I think there's just a tension between, uh, from the perspective of the user having lots of options and lots of diversity on um, platform policies on the one hand, and on the other hand, having a, a place where controls can be managed. But I, also, I don't, it's not obvious to me why it would be so hard to, to you know, weaponize speech in some of the ways that are truly disruptive of speech. And it's, uh, and it's not, or to continue misinformation. And I mean that broadly, not just foreign and misinformation. Sort of flooding and attacking and distorting. It's not clear to me why you couldn't do that across 10 platforms as opposed to three or four. I just don't, maybe there's a way that it would put the brakes on. I just don't see it. You know, I'm, Jack, I'm, what's up? I'm not sure I'm following that, Jack. Is this responsive, Jack? One, you know, WhatsApp recently announced that some new, new restrictions on how many people you can forward a message to. And that has greatly, greatly restricted the amount of fake news and rumors that have been spreading on the platform. Yeah. So that's, but that's not about breaking up. That's about rules about, yeah. that's about attacking the mechanisms that allow speech to become weaponized. But it is also kind of imposing an internal constraint on the size of the net, of any individual's network, right? So it's an, it's kind of like, to Ken's point, kind of like an internal breakup of the network. Yeah, I agree. And that's an example of control that might, that the companies are imposing that might you know, make the speech environment better. Tom, the floor is yours. Uh, yeah, hi. Um, so I'm thinking about the reasons that we're seeing a proliferation of speech controls on social platforms. And the, the main reason seems to be that there's a, a huge public demand because of all these harms. Uh, and I'm, I'm thinking in contrast to um, gun control, where we see um, lots of very visible harm and, and uh, widespread public support for various measures here, and yet we don't get any gun control whatsoever. How is that different from the pressure for speech control where we also see harms and we see public demand and we are getting the speech controls? That's a good question, Tom. I'll just say the first reaction, the first immediate thought that I had to all of the vitriol that I received in my uh, DMs after we published this piece was, wow, it's amazing how many people think the First Amendment is just like the Second Amendment and the way that the politics of it. Get, you know, don't get your grubby hands off of my Facebook, was essentially, uh, you know, you're gonna pry my Facebook from my, de my cold dead hands. Um, I think that another answer, again, I'm way outside my league. Another answer is the companies that care about the complaints about speech. The companies care about complaints about speech because they're their customers. And the, sec the customers of the second of, of gun shops don't care about these complaints. I think it's that simple. Um, 
can I just ask one quick question on that? Yes, sure. The market dynamic thing. Um, after mass shootings, gun sales go up. After the weaponization of speech, does the use of speech platforms go up? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, um, after, after we, there's a bad event on the network, after a group of people get killed, there's tends to be ramped up controls. That doesn't happen in the it, it does not happen in terms of the private sector in with guns. The opposite happens. Um, we have a question from an anonymous attendee. Uh, Professor Goldsmith, do you see any disconnect between your SSRN draft on modern media reporting on leaks and your remarks today regarding a trend toward greater regulation of speech? Do you think the media outlets will accept greater regulation of run-of-the-mill speech, but regulation of secret revelation speech will remain politically radioactive? So give, before you answer that question, give a little description of the other draft so that people know what we're comparing. So I wrote a piece, a short piece for a collected volume about national security and um, national security reporting. And the conventional wisdom, especially in the Obama administration, is that the government had cracked down on national security reporting and that there was a crisis in national security reporting because of the Obama administration, especially its increase in national security prosecutions, which have to some extent, at least in investigations, been continued by the Trump administration. And I argue there that I didn't think that there was, that I thought that there was a norm, a norm had developed in the last 20 years in favor of more speech uh, regulation, excuse me, of more national security reporting, and a norm had developed of government restraint in going after journalists and national security reporting. And I think that's, that's, that is backed up by the facts. I don't exactly see any contradiction or even tension. I was thinking primarily about, um, the contestation in the national security reporting context is between the um, the outlets, mostly traditional outlets, and the government, and the harms there that are from the reporting have been deemed to be acceptable. This is the remarkable thing about the norm: is that the harms of publishing national security information, which have increased and increased, and, and the the amount and percentage of national security reporting of classified information has grown enormously since 9-11. And whatever the costs, however you assess them, basically the government has taken the view that it's willing to accept those costs, even though it complains about them, although it complains less than it used to, and is not gonna go after journalists because this norm has developed that journalists are allowed to do this. So I don't see, I don't really see the analogy between that and what we're talking about, which is uh, weaponized speech among individuals on platforms. I do think, though, that the, the question highlights the sort of paradox that I was alluding to yesterday, which is the sort of increasing regulation coincides with uh, a, no apparent decrease and an explosion, or maybe because it responds to uh, an explosion in the underlying type of speech. And so, you know, publication of classified leaks is um you know ex you know the the gloves are off from the media's perspective just at the time when the administration is prosecuting more of these cases and i suppose you can square that circle uh the way you guys did in response to my earlier posing of it which is that the additional regulation is a response to the explosion yeah, I um, think but, I do, but i do think it fits that same pattern we just don't know what the causation has been and we don't know what impact it's having. It could be that there are all sorts of reasons that you and I have discussed that I've written about that we've written about why classified information is flying out of the government more than it used to. And there's been a hand, you know, compared to the change in terms of leaks of public and publication of national security information, I think that the government response has been relatively weak and it has not been strong enough to go after, to, to stop, to ebb the flow, although we don't know what kind of deterrent effect it's had. And the remarkable thing is it hasn't gone, if, if the government went after journalists, you would see different leak patterns. There's no doubt about this. 
but the government, for whatever reason, and it's not clear if it's constitutional law or constitutional norms or politics, has decided, I think they decided this because the secrecy of bureaucracy has grown so huge after 9-11 and so presumptively problematic because of the massively expanded secrecy in the government. I think the government just, and, and because so many of the leaks have revealed government practices that the country didn't accept and caused changes, I just think that, um, I think that the government, that, 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 that there are 10 different reasons why these leaks are happening more aggressively and the government has not taken very aggressive steps to stop it. And that's why you're gonna see this continuing. And as I argue in the piece, I think the government, the government has actually, I think accepted a norm that except in very rare occasions, it's not gonna do anything with journalists uh, and certainly not gonna prosecute them. I mean, you know, remember after Stellar Wind was exposed in 2004, 2005, there were serious discussions in the country about whether the New York Times should be prosecuted under the provision of the Espionage Act that um, allows prosecution for publication of signals intelligence information. You have many, 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 many more massive leaks since then, and you don't see, except in the Snowden case, you don't see calls for that anymore. And even in the Snowden case, it is limited to WikiLeaks. Um, it's limited to WikiLeaks. It's not a, uh, there's no been no move against any mainstream journalism outlet that has. Um, it's really, yeah, it's, and it's really a remarkable thing. And McGraw, is that, that, uh, the New York Times general counsel in charge of this, he basically said I was on a panel, and this was a remarkable thing about four years ago. He basically said, I'm paraphrasing, we used to be worried about publishing these things. We used to be worried about legal liability, but we don't really worry about it. It's amazing. All right, uh, Evelyn Dweck, uh, who for uh, listeners, viewers who uh, don't know her, is uh, one of the uh, leading authorities on questions of content moderation and uh, writes amazing stuff on the subject for Lawfare. Um, Evelyn, the floor is yours. Uh, thanks, Ben. Thanks for that introduction. Um, obviously, they should just put me in charge of this problem. Then, uh, as, a, as a leading authority, I'd, I'd settle all of it. Um, thanks for this conversation. It's super interesting, obviously, to me. Um, I, far be it from me to talk about uh, the Second Amendment as a non-American, um, that I don't understand it. But I think one of the things that um, is different here is that speech is a, a special kind of right in the sense that uh, once you infringe on that, you cut off the channel for arguing about whether that's an appropriate standard in a way that you don't with other kinds of rights. And it's, you know, this goes back to John Hart Ely's theory of representation reinforcing with the First Amendment. Um, but if you shut down on speech, you shut down the space to argue about whether that's uh, the right uh, interpretation of the right. So I think that that's something um, just in response to that question. Um, and I fully agree with um, what you two said about uh, competition not being an answer to this. I was struck by um, Margaret Vestager had an interview in the New York, the New Yorker yesterday um, with Isaac Chotner. And she's, you know, the queen of European Union uh, competition policy and really gung ho on it. And even she say, you know, in, in this sense, in sometimes you, if you cut off uh, one head, you just create a hydra and there's going to be many, many more. For a lot of these problems, we just need standards. Competition's not going to... Um, not going to fix the problem, uh, which I guess is what brings me to my question. I'm, I'm one of those terrible people that says, my question is uh, more of a comment. Um, my question is this, I think one of the reasons why uh, potentially your argument was um, misunderstood was because you didn't sort of set out like a positive vision of what you think. It was sort of more a predict predictive vision of uh, there's going to be more standards and there's going to be more control, which um, I agree with you is not really a controversial comment. I think that's pretty much where we all are. Um, but it was sort of the comparison with China and the idea that maybe, you know, uh, all regulation is alike um, or, or all regulation is authoritarian that sort of got misunderstood. And so I wonder whether you can help us at all on this uh, entirely difficult question of like what, if we are in a space where regulation is inevitable um, and control is inevitable, what does that look like? What's your positive vision for that space? Um. I, this is going to seem like a cop-out, but I haven't sorted it out yet. Um, I don't like government regulation of speech. I mean, that's a strong prior, and I think that's a strong prior of the First Amendment, obviously. Um, 
So I don't like that solution, even though it's it, it's coming. And it's in some contexts, you know, when it intersects with national security, I'm more comfortable with it in the misinformation context, assuming that the misinformation, foreign misinformation context can be properly cabined and it's not going to have spillover effects. I mean, the distinction between domestic propaganda and Trump getting his groups to start doing things on the network and all sorts of uh, group weaponization of speech domestically and distinguishing that from foreign influence operations, I think is hard. My strong prior, for what it's worth, is against government regulation of speech. Um, but then again, I don't think that the situation we have now for the reason Zuckerberg says is sustainable either. Um, for the reasons I said earlier, it's just uh, that, that because so much of public forum speech in this country takes place on a couple of platforms, and since they have such a pretty elaborate criteria for what they're going to be taking down, and since they've been taking down more and more, there's just a strong question about whether the public, whether this private entity should be regulating speech for the country in a way that's somewhat narrower than the First Amendment allows. So, you know, I don't have a magic bullet, I'm afraid. I'm, 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 we're trying to figure that out. I don't know if Andrew has a better answer. Yeah, uh, what's, what's your positive vision here? <laughs> I, I don't like the way that Jack ended there, ask, su suggesting that my answer is better. I, I don't want to claim that, but I do think, um, I agree, I'm not a big fan of uh, government mandates on speech, but let's just be clear, before, before the internet was invented, there were all sorts of ways in which the government did in fact regulate speech. There are limits on speech. And it just seems to me the interesting question going forward is how do we figure out what the digital equivalent of shouting fire in a crowded theater is, right? So where are the you know, legitimate restrictions on speech that were consistent with the First Amendment in the past um, are going to be developed now in this new digital space? And that's, that's really the open and interesting question um, on speech, which I don't know enough about. And Evelyn, we need to talk more. Um, I really like your work. Uh, on, um, on surveillance, I feel a bit differently, and I just think it's a different sort of problem. Um, you know, the, if, if the government had proposed to, to put cameras on every other house in every neighborhood in America, right, that would never have been okay. So instead, the alternative was every other American went out and bought Ring camera, and then Ring created partnerships with law enforcement agencies all over the country. That, that strikes me as kind of crazy, that we allowed a system of private surveillance where I get to spy on my neighbors and then the cops can use law. That just seems like a poorly thought out system of private surveillance with after the fact back end government access that doesn't, doesn't seem, seems ripe for serious rethinking. And that might involve, just speaking for myself here, I don't know about Jack, more government involvement in how we think about privacy. Um, you know, so again, you know, to the commenter about uh, Europe at the very beginning of this conversation, it's not a call to become more like China, but you, you know, a call enhancing autonomy, freedom, you know, whatever fundamental American values you think are most dear um, might involve more government involvement in regulating tech. Can I just say one more thing, and Evelyn sure. knows as well. So we're talking about regulating speech, and it's very important, I think, just to remember that there are all sorts of different categories that get regulated. There is, I'm just looking on at, at Facebook's high level list and it gets subdivided after this. There's violence and criminal behavior. There's safety issues that take the form of speech. Objectionable content, that's pr probably a more controversial area because objectionable tends to be in the eye of the beholder. Hate speech, which has a whole list of subcategories, violent and graphic content, adult nudity and sexual activity, sexual solicitation, cruel and insensitive speech, integrity and authenticity, speech concerning intellectual property. These are all very different strands of speech and probably ultimately these questions are gonna get answered differently in different ways for different types of speech. In some areas the government can have more of an input and maybe should. In some areas, it's harder for the government to have an input, even though it's hard for the companies to come up with standards. All right. Two, uh, one, one, one 
provocation on this subject, and then I want to turn to surveillance, which Andrew uh, alert, alluded to, and you guys uh, treated at some length in the original Atlantic piece. Um, but first, the provocation. Why isn't the right positive vision here nuke 230? That is, um, there is a very heavy government intervention here. And it is to immunize the platforms for all third party speech on them, essentially without qualification. I mean, there's, there is the old qualification of uh, protecting intellectual property, right? The, the DMCA. And there's the new qualification, which is you know, limited to certain types of, of uh, pornography. Um, but, the basic rule is the government in 1996 stuck a very, very heavy hand on the scale that said, who's ever responsible for the substance of these, uh, what goes on these platforms, it ain't the platforms. And so we're talking about this as a kind of libertarian environment that has become less libertarian as the platforms have begun but it's a, it's a libertarian environment that was engineered that way. And so my question is, why shouldn't we simply remove blanket uh, platform li liability, let a gazillion people all over the world sue these platforms in every state in the United States, in every federal court in the United States, and make a huge amount of law about what the platform's obligations are, not in, uh, uh, um, not in uh, 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 you know, a huge amount of law, not in uh, content, uh, you know, Facebook terms of service or, you know, but in actual litigation case uh -huh. by case. So I'm not yet an expert on 230. I mean, I know about 230. I think it's a great question, Ben. And yesterday, my research assistant, I asked for a few days ago, please get me everything about 230 that will help me to understand what the world would look like if 230 went away tomorrow. And that's what you're asking. And what I don't know the answer to is whether, I just don't know what would happen. I don't know if it would mean that but for fear of liability, these platforms would cut out 80% of what they're allowing now whether they would cut out 2% of what they're allowing now. Um, and I just don't know what it would do to the speech environment, but I assume given the background that's grown up <coughs> over 25 years in the, in the shadow of 230, that it would have a huge impact at first and it, it involve a huge contraction of speech in the country and therefore might be worse the disease, it, it, the cure might be worse than the disease. But I think it, well, let me say, I think it's a very interesting question to try to figure out. And I, and then of course there are lots of intermediate possibilities in sort of chiseling away at 2:30, which is probably more likely what's going to happen, and uh, probably the better way to go in terms of developing legal standards. You're absolutely right. The way you set it up is that we have a kind of government-sponsored uh, libertarian. Um, speech environment that the companies themselves under pressure are contracting. So I think it's a great question. And I don't know, I don't have a strong view about what the answer is, what it would look like. Andrew, what do you think? I think that's all right. Um, and it's a good question. And, you know, yesterday we were chatting with um, Daniel Hemmel at Chicago, who put it this way, you know, there, there's government libertarianism and then there's corporate libertarianism. And the system we have is something like a government mandated corporate libertarianism, right? Um, with, with now an erosion under public pressure from customers and politicians. Um, and it's, it's that dynamic of figuring out who do we want the, de the decision maker to be? And you know, I'm not sure federal judges are the, are the worst way of resolving this. But again, I do think it does come down to this question that Jack says, you know, what's the world look like? I don't know. With tech, you know, there's this, this old debate, Orrin Kerr and Dan Solov had this debate. It's happened in other contexts about who should make tech policy, legislatures or courts. 
And of course, the story is legislatures can get fact finders, they can make sweeping changes, whereas courts can only deal with the case or controversy before them. And um, some people think that's a negative, like Warren Kerr made the case against courts making policy. The good thing about courts is they only deal with the case or controversy before them. So you end up with this, you know, um, bric-a-brac mishmash, which is a bit of a mess, but also slowly, incrementally works its way towards a sensible policy and, um, or towards a policy, which may or may not be sensible. And that's the way we've developed the First Amendment. And maybe that's what we, maybe that's the right strategy here vis-a-vis -vis corporate policies, um, you know, post. Although you might, although you might have a hell of a lot more chilling than where the courts are at the moment. I mean, the courts might be getting rid of A and B, but the companies might worry about C, D, E, F, and G and just not yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't doubt for a minute that it would be ugly um, and that you would have a period of immense churn and a lot of irrationality in that period of churn. I just, I, I'm just uh, puzzled by the, the assumption that the one thing that, you know, the, the one thing that heavily conditions this environment that is not really on the table is whether the platforms should be immune. But Ben, um, don't you think it's more likely, uh, you've written about this, don't you think it's more likely that we, just because you know, the nuclear option is just too disruptive and too uncertain, don't you think it's more, uh, more likely that we see piecemeal changes? Yeah, and I, I, I think there's, you know, there's, so Danielle Citrin and I wrote a long article proposing such a change. Yeah. Um, and I, you know, I... Ben, just to be clear, when you say long article, that's just a law review article. It's the only law review article I've ever written. Yeah, and, it's really good. Um, and, and, you're, it was, and you're proud of it and you didn't enjoy it. <laughs> no, no, actually, the, the, um, my contribution to this article was to sketch out literally on a napkin uh, what I thought the, re the two, section 230 should read. And Danielle's response was, we need to write this as a law review article. And um, my contribution to it was literally, you know, uh, uh, like, like that kernel of the idea. And um, so I don't really want, it's really Danielle's article. Um, I was just so, making fun of the fact that you're not the greatest fan of law review articles. No, I am an opponent of law review articles. And if I didn't think the idea was as good at, like, if I didn't think the point was as important as I did, I would never have let Danielle talk me into writing one. Um, so I, I do think we're unlikely to see blanket uh, repeal of 230. The danger of piecemeal, of course, is that you do it sort of subject matter wise, and then you have this kind of weird Vietnam syndrome of kind of fighting the last war, right? And, you know, you're upset about a particular revenge porn case, right? So you have a 230 for revenge porn, but not for sextortion, right? And you, you're imagining the problem that exists right now, not in a dynamic internet environment. And so what you never do uh, is actually think about the principle, right? What, like the, the elegance of 230 is that it was a principle. Um, it's a really overbroad principle, but like, okay, I, the question I'm interested in is how do you narrow the principle, not what very specific cases do you create exemptions from it yeah. for? So- That's a hugely uh, important question. Jim Baker, uh, the former uh, general counsel of the FBI, um, is on the line. Jim, the floor is yours. Oops, wait, but you're muted. Let's unmute Oops. you. Jim, can from you, the R Street you... Institute, we can hear you. H how are you feeling? I'm, I'm doing well today, thank you. I appreciate it, on a, on a rainy day in DC. So anyway, can you hear me now though, Ben? Indeed. Okay, good. So uh, thanks to Jack and Andrew for their article. It certainly was thought provoking and very interesting. And I apologize, I missed the first part of the, uh, of the Zoom conference. But I just wanted to ask, I mean, look, I don't have some overarching solution to the issues that, uh, that Andrew and Jack raised. And so I, I'm just kind of like, when I was reading the article, my mind sort of focused on one part of the problem. And admittedly, it's just one part of it. 
and it's probably colored by my time at the FBI, but having to do with misinformation and disinformation. And so what I'm sort of focused on is, can, can we deal with at least part of the issue that exists with all this, all this speech with, uh, with more transparency? In other words, if, and what's, uh, what's that website, Ben, that you often tweet about, Bot Sentinel, right? So if, if, if there were some type of score or indication if, if there was an easier way for people to understand who the speakers were, right? This was the whole theory behind the laws about uh, foreign agents uh, registration uh, that came into being, you know, in the World War II timeframe, where people wanted to know, well, who are these people that are speaking and are, do they have any connection to the Nazi government in Germany? And so, you know, look, I mean, foreign governments don't really have free speech rights. Foreign officials don't really, and at least in the United States. And we don't really care, I think, about the free speech right of bots. And so is there is one way to start to deal with this? Again, it's a start and it's, it's not a, a huge solution uh, or a solution to any huge part of this. But, you know, I, I just am thinking about transparency and what I'd be interested in what Jack and Andrew think yeah. about bringing more transparency about who the speaker actually is. You mean getting rid of anonymity or do you mean? No, but uh, if somebody speaks on if somebody speaks on a platform providing, figuring out a way to provide more information about who they are to enable the, in other words, not suppressing the speech, but enabling the listener to take it, to, to receive it in a different way. Yeah. So I'm not an expert on this. The companies, I mean, Facebook does something like this and some misinformation, they tag the misinformation. If they deem it to be misleading or false, instead of removing it, they tag it they suggest you go to an expert and look at another view. So that's one way of dealing with this. And I think they're, they're trying all sorts of strategies to try to do this. The problem is, and I think it's you know, useful in parts and strategies like this. The problem is who are the authorities? Who's watching the watchers? It was troubling when that Facebook is relying on central, the authorities, it, it's potentially troubling that Facebook is relying on health authorities to decide what counts as information that's acceptable in the network and what counts isn't or what should be um, um, downgraded because the authorities make mistakes. They make a lot of mistakes. They've been making mistakes. And one of the ways you find out about the mistakes they make, obviously, is to allow people to criticize them and have alternate views. So the answer is yes, that clearly is happening. It's coming more. It's probably, again, I don't really have a enough experience with it to know whether it's good or bad, but it's probably a move in the right direction. But, and I think that by the way, I think Monica Bickert said on a podcast I listened to that they do have a way for you to check and see who, not only to see who the fact checkers are and to learn about them. So there is a move towards more transparency along the lines you're talking about. And I do think that is part of the solution, yes. Andrew, do you have thoughts on that? The only thing I'll say, it's a great question. I th um, it, it brings to mind the idea that we, that we haven't surfaced yet that speech controls, you know, forgive for lack of a better phrase, are not um, binary. It's not just you, you block the content or you allow it. There's, there are a million different things you can do, including flagging, giving viewers more information, contextualizing the post that the information appears in. And then maybe most importantly in all, of all, um, the deciding how and how the algorithm works that decides what material gets promoted. And I think one of the most troubling um, questions raised about the platforms is do they have a financial incentive to have controversial misinformation <clears throat> upvoted because it is more likely to get clicks and views. Yeah. There was an excellent uh, radio lab, I think it was, episode recently or maybe it was maybe it was a New York Times podcast. I can't, I can't remember who did it about the engineer at YouTube who right. did uh, who designed the uh, algorithm that feeds you incessantly mm. the precise content that you want and the way that he kind of first developed that, but secondly. Mm became concerned that basically he was, you know, feeding ISIS um, and eventually raised concerns within Google about it and got fired. Um, 
and this is you know, central. The, to, this is central to the way they make money. Uh, obviously, I, to keep your attention, Tim Wu wrote a great book about this. Uh, it's central to the way they make money, and obviously, it's come into question in the last few years. And they're obviously trying to balance it off, but we don't really know uh, how much, how all these factors weigh into their to their um, profit calculations. YouTube is remarkably good at feeding me yeah. the precise arias from the precise operas sung by the precise people that I want to hear. And if you think about that in a less harmful context than listening to music, uh, you know, the precise preacher giving you the precise theme of the precise radicalism that you're interested in uh, and escalating you in that. It's a very, uh, it's a very interesting problem of, uh, to go back to the, an earlier uh, caller's question, segmentation. Yeah, and th this Cass, identif Cass Hansen identified this 20 years ago as the daily me. And it's not good for our speech environment because you're not, you don't accidentally run into views you don't want to see. You tend to see the things you want to see. You tend to get worked up about what you're seeing because it tends to be slanted in accordance with your prejudices. So it's one of the things, again, these are generalizations. It's one of the things, one of the many things that's degrading our speech environment, I think. All right. I think we have time for one more question and it goes to Matthew Gluck. Uh, Matthew, the floor is yours. Hi, thank you so much for this informative discussion. Um, so my question, uh, so you say in your article that the 2016 election was a wake up call and that it illustrated the ease with which foreign actors can harm our system. Um, do you see any other similar wake up calls on the horizon that you think could sway public opinion and potentially um, views in courts on governmental and internet network control? And if so, what could those wake up calls be and how could they change those perspectives? Here's one. That's a great question, Matthew. I mean, what, what, imagine if tomorrow um, a rumor spreads about a home remedy for COVID-19 that leads to lots of harm. That, that would be, that, that's a plausible, it seems to me a plausible scenario that would be very scary. Or um, something happening on the network that, that incites really, really horrible violence in the world, big larger than we've seen. Or I think the most likely is that this election is screwed up worse than the last because of not just misinformation, but the reaction to misinformation and the overreaction to misinformation and domestic misinformation. I, I fear that this election is going to be much, much worse than the last one. And I think that if that's the case, assuming we get through it, that there will be, we'll just have to think harder about how to deal with the problem. On that cheerful note, uh, we're going to wrap up. Um, thank you, Ben. Uh, uh, yeah, thank you both for doing this. This is a super interesting conversation, and I hope got past the, pardon me, bullshit about your original article. Um, uh, and so we will uh, post a version of this uh, on YouTube to, to Lawfare. Uh, and if you have enjoyed this conversation, uh, please do tweet it when it goes up so that others can can watch it retroactively. And can uh, I make a recommendation for anyone who's still listening or might watch in the future? Because I listened yesterday to your interview in the Lawfare podcast with, uh, is it Sophia Yuan from the Financial yeah. Times? The most interesting thing I've heard about the situation in China on coronavirus. Really, really interesting and insightful. I love Sophia's work. Your questions were great. It was a really, really good podcast. Well, thank you. So for those of you who don't know her, Sophia is, uh, you have heard her because she plays piano on all the Lawfare podcast episodes. She is a uh, conservatory trained pianist. She is also uh, the London Telegraph's uh, reporter in Beijing, and she has been uh, incredibly courageous in going after uh, stories about Uyghur detentions and uh, just came back from a trip to Wuhan where she was uh, reporting on how the city is recovering. And she's been uh, 
in Beijing lockdown, which is really different from US lockdown. And so some of the interesting parts of the podcast are just for descriptions of what it means to be in lockdown in Beijing and how tight and close the surveillance really is and how it works. So it's an interesting, uh, it's an interesting podcast, particularly in light of some of these conversations. I will note that we recorded it without interference from the Chinese government. Uh, on a, yeah, I mean, it was, uh, we recorded it using our normal tech. She was in her apartment in Beijing. I was in my house and the, uh, uh, the audio is pretty seamless. And so that I thought was an interesting example of what is and is not regulated in the Chinese internet. Uh, with that aside, uh, thank you all for joining us and you, we will do more of these in the coming weeks. Thanks, Ben. Thanks, Andrew.